For those of you who don't know, I have autism. It's something I've known about for the longest time, and I take a lot of pride in it. It is a brain disorder, however, one of the things that I've done a lot is I've helped people understand autism. People who have autism, I've talked with a lot and tried to help them feel more confident in themselves. And I've showed people that even with its downsides, there are positives to having it. The main reason I want to make this video is very simple. I want to both share with people that autism is a thing and get, allow people to better understand it. But I also want to show people who have autism that there is hope for you to do things and you should not be super nervous about it because while it can be intimidating to do things, well, people can do it. And nobody who has autism is exclu excluded. So there are two main ways I want to go about with this video. First off, before we get into the main segment you're probably here for, um, I want to talk a bit about what autism is. I can share a bunch of experiences with you, but it doesn't mean anything if you don't understand what we're talking about. So, as mentioned, autism is a brain disorder. If you're born with it, you have it for life, you don't develop it, you don't get autism in the middle of your life, it's just there, and it's not going anywhere. The main thing it does is it alters the way you perceive information. Basically put it that you and someone with autism, or if you have autism, you and someone without autism get the same information, the information will not be processed the same way. This changes a lot on how a person lives because, number one, it makes information harder to process at time, or sometimes easier to process. Usually it's harder, though. It makes it so that small interactions through social cues are just not absorbed a lot of the time if a person has autism, and on top of that, it even potentially changes the way that the brain functions in terms of basic functionalities, such as listening, hearing, and just smelling things, where, at least a personal example I have, where small noises are a lot more noticed by my brain than average. Things like this small little machine make letting out um, air so that the processor can work better, I hear it a lot more than someone else. There's a lot of small examples, and the way it works is very dependent on the use case. How autism functions in my brain is different than someone else's, and I'm not going to say it's a, it's a one case fits all, because it's not. That's the reason why it's called a spectrum, because there's a lot of different cases. Lastly, before we move on to the next big thing, I want to talk about the misconception of high functioning and low functioning. Low functioning does not mean can't do anything. High functioning does not mean you're really good. It just is a thing used by professionals to deem what functions of yours fit society best. And it's a system I personally really dislike because saying someone's low functioning can discourage a lot of people and I've met people who are low-functioning who have been very demotivated by just the term, which understandably so, and people who are high-functioning who feel extremely bad that they feel like they need help for things when, in reality, they're, they still have the rights to that help. The best way to put it, in the case of high-functioning, because low-functioning, there's a, a list of examples online of low-functioning people doing great things, but... And the best way to put it for high functioning is that imagine someone is slightly blind and the eye doctor tells you you're not allowed glasses because you're not fully blind. I think you can kind of see where the problem would go, where there'd be a lot of issues for them, where they'd not be able to see everything unless they get glasses. So instead of spending more time talking about something that is very complicated and will take a very long time to properly do, I'm instead going to introduce the next segments. I have three other guests here to talk about their experience in the Splatoon scene. All three of these people also have some level of autism and are all people who've been in the scene for a good bit. I wanted the chance to share people's experience here and I do want to say a huge thanks to everybody who offered to help throughout this video. But yeah. 
I'm going to stop ranting. I'll let them talk about their experiences and be back once they're finished with mine. I'm Adrian. I am an S plus 50. Go for one trick. I've been around overall in the competitive scene for about a year. I have only recently started playing it in around June, July. I've recently gotten third in 30 seconds quad junction and second in hammerhead bracket in SOS 89. When I was young, I ended up getting diagnosed with autism around like three to five. I forgot specifically, but I remember being told by my mom about it. And I didn't really process it until I was older. In terms of how um, like my social skills were prior to joining the competitive scene, it was kind of in the middle. Like I had awkward interactions. I just haven't been able to be that social up until like becoming more involved in the competitive scene and playing in competitive. I tried a Splatoon out of curiosity and specifically competitive from streamers and top players in North America and Japan, like Leo, Takabon, and some of the more top players in both Japan and NA. My first experiences about the scene, I think I just felt like confused. I didn't really have the most experience at the start. Or at least didn't really process what was going on. My first tournament, I was sub for it, which was a SOS. I think it was 75 or 76 with a pickup around like D4 to D3. <laughs> but after that, I ended up getting into a project which went better than that. I got to play how autism has affected, impacted my time in the competitive scene. I think it's made me kind of realize more of a passion for Splatoon from it being one of a fixations or just simply a special interest, helping a little, know a little into kind of becoming not really recognized, but just more smart with competitive or realizing it more, kind of has expanded that a little bit, or at least kind of broken a link from like a fixation to like something becoming a lot more like enjoyable, basically. What helped me try, no, what helped being more comfortable in the competitive scene was acceptance to overall more opportunities, tournaments, projects, etc. Beating people, especially with Squid Junction recently, I'm getting third. I feel like not really a lot of people knew me until then, or at least people knew me, but not really that much. Also, connections helped, specifically people who I trust. If you want to follow me on Twitter, my Twitter is Adrian double underscore SBLA. We'll see active anyways there. And if you want to see general my Squiffer bolts or just other stuff, my send is sendes.inc slash she slash Adrian. I'm considering streaming eventually on Twitch or like trying to get probably this year or next year primarily. I'm trying to get a capture card to stream that type of stuff because I want to have better VOD reviews or just like show community more Squiffer content considering that not a lot of people play Squiffer anymore in the community. Hi, I'm Spool. I'm one of the best English players in the West and I've been a competitive Splatoon player since August 2018. Uh, I used to play for Chewitz Mafia, which was the best team in the United Kingdom and one of the top European teams at the end of Splatoon 2. And I also make content from time to time. I recently uploaded a video about whether I think the new English kit will be good. I was diagnosed when I was four, so that would have been up 16 years ago. Uh, back then the diagnoses were split depending on where the pediatrician thought you lay on the spectrum, so I was diagnosed with Asperger's, and in fact this is how I... This is just what I say when I meet someone, and I just... And when I do tell people that I am on the spectrum, I do say that I have Asperger's. Um, I was never really told how it would affect me though, like, I was told what it was, um, it was like a, just a cold definition, but I didn't understand how it properly affected me, so I kind of had to piece it together over the years, um, and that, I didn't really, like, fit all the pieces together until I was about 13 or 14. Uh, I had very, I had a very selective social skill set before I joined Competitive Splatoon, like, I had a friend group and I hung out with them and I found interactions in school really easy. They came almost naturally. But interactions with people outside of school and like casual situations with people my own age, I struggled a lot with. 
Um, I never really like got a chance to hang out with my friends outside of school very often. They lived really far away. Um, and my parents were like very overprotective of me as a kid. So basically I didn't like, I had the, the skills were very underdeveloped, um, before I joined the scene. So I initially got into Splatoon because I used to play another third person shooter game, Plants vs Zombies Garden Warfare. Um, the main YouTuber for that at the time was uh, Zach Scott Games, and he made YouTube content for both. So I got into him because of his Guard Warfare content, and then I saw him playing Splatoon. Uh, funnily enough, it was the Inkbrush video that he did uh, way back. It was the first one that I saw, and it was like, and he was like, you know, like he was playing the game, and I, I'd heard a little bit about Splatoon, so like before, and how unique it was as a shooter. So I was like, oh, he's playing this. I want to see, you know, I want to see what it's like. It looked really, really fun. I decided then that I was going to get in the game. Uh, my parents almost tried to uh, stop me, though, because they saw that it was a shooter game, and they were like, no, you are not allowed to have this. It is a shooter game. They shoot things. And I'm like, no, they, they shoot paint guns, and they have, they're like paint rolls and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's the only reason why I'm allowed to play Splatoon in uh, this day and age. I didn't get into the competitive community, or just the community in general, really, until 2018, though. Uh, and that happened for a fairly different reason. So, I had a pretty difficult home life at the time, and I used to try and avoid it by just locking myself in my room and studying for my exams, which, you know, was a fine plan, except my exams happened, and then I didn't have any more, and I suddenly had basically less reason to... I basically had no good reason to lock myself in my room all the time, so I was basically just looking for a reason to do that, and also looking for something new to do, because I've been doing so much, like, academic work for the past, like, couple of years. And around this time, I got a video I'm recommended by, the SMB2 dude, and I watched it, and I just so happened to have a Discord and Twitter that I'd both recently made, and yeah, I, um... I just decided to take the plunge, and uh, I joined the Academy server, started talking in there, and yeah, here we are about four and a half years later. I remember being very overwhelmed at first, because there was so much to learn. Like, a lot of my special interests that I had before Splatoon were all things that were relatively, like, static, right? And the way I, the media that I consumed them through was also relatively static. So I used to be really into dinosaurs, right? And at the time that I was growing up, you needed books for that. <laughs> so all the all you would pick up all these books from like the nineties, and that would be your like source of information on dinosaur knowledge, right? But this is a different thing. This is an actively rolling beast, and it's my first time properly interacting with an actual like community for something. So, because of that, it was like, not only having to learn all of the knowledge and lingo and things within the community, so things like callouts, weapon names, weapon abbreviations, um, ability abbreviations as well, um, and also having to learn about like who the top players and people in the community were, but also just learning into like personal skills, things like communication and Things like communication and teamwork um, that I didn't really have at the time. Uh, and I had to learn a lot of that stuff the hard way. Um, my first six months of being in competitive, I was on two teams, and I have only ever been on uh, five teams competitively. I tend to like say I've only been on four because the first team that I was on was barely even a team, but like for this, it feels appropriate to say that I was on it because. You know, it was a learning experience with this kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, like, learning all of that was very overwhelming, but something that you also have to remember is that as overwhelming as it can be, like, the sheer joy of getting to learn so much more about your special interest, or, like, hobby or whatever, is absolutely insane. And any, like any sort of time I was overwhelmed, that would basically outweigh it almost all the time. The only time that it didn't was where my second team, that basically uh, fell apart because of really, um, really like weird and shitty situation, and 
I didn't know how to deal with it at all at the time, and it very much overwhelmed me. And I was really stupid, and they put it on Twitter, like, the situation. And, um, yeah, there was a lot of, there was a lot of drama about that. I still feel really bad about it, and, yeah. Um, but, overall, it's, like I say, it's being, it's about being, like, it's being overwhelmed. But, overall, like... As unloving as it was, it was still really, really fun to learn stuff and meet new people and all this. So, you know. How much do you think awesome has impacted your time? The come scene in what ways? Uh, it's definitely been the most impactful thing overall. Um, like, it's made it a lot easier to talk to other people about the game because, like, I'll naturally just start trying to talk about it eventually at some point. Uh, if I have a, if it's a common interest between me and those people. Um, and, you know, being able to nerd out about the game, like, means that I get to learn a lot, they get to learn a lot, and overall, everybody's just having an incredibly good time. Um, i describe it as one of the, I'd say, like, having a group of, you know, autistic people who all share the same special interest, being able to nerd out about it in a healthy way, is one of the very few things in life that is at, like, 100% better than, like, you know, having sex, anything like that, like, that feeling of just having a group like that is absolutely insane. Um, that's really, like, it also, like, talking to those people means you learn a lot more about yourself, like, autism doesn't affect the same, autism doesn't affect everybody in uh, the same way, it affects everybody differently. So, being able to talk to those people and seeing how their autism affects them, and then how my autism affects me as well, like, it helps you learn a lot about both yourself and about other people and about how the world works. Um, the autistic brain, I think, is also just really good at, like, like having an, like, an autistic mind as well as also, like, basically just underpinned my entire understanding of both the game and the community around the game. And you'll find, like, you, chances are, if you know any of my opinions, if you look down far enough, like, something related to autism is probably an underpinning factor that led me to that conclusion. Um, definitely, like, some of the biggest things, like, it's definitely most noticeable, it's the most noticeable, I think, when I do VOD reviews. Like, not very many people have been around me when I VOD review, but, but those people will tell you that when I am VOD reviewing, I will look at, like, the tiniest fucking thing, and I'll just be like, oh, that was really good, or, oh, that was really bad. And just being able to, like, break down these, like, situations into really small chunks, and then just analyzing each of those really tiny chunks in detail, like, it's really fun for me, but it's also a fantastic way to learn about, you know, like, it's also a fantastic way to learn how to improve at the game, and I'd attribute my, like, I've I've always been one of those players that like sort of like has improved steadily over time and I'd attribute a lot of that to being able to just look at the little like look at the really tiny fragments that make up, you know, my play or somebody else's play or whatever. Um It's also a skill that like is really it's a it's a skill that definitely like shows up a lot in like forties as well, especially ones with restricted formats, like some of my best tournament results have come from tournaments which feature restricted formats. Um, like, for example, there was a tournament last year called Shopping Spree, which the format for that was basically each team was given like twenty, like twenty dollars, and every weapon was assigned like a a cost, and you had to try and build a team comp without going over twenty dollars. And uh, it was like through that, through building that comp, uh, we became. My team, uh, which was literally just a pickup, uh, we were the highest placed European team in that entire tournament. Um, and also just things like, even if this tor the format isn't restricted, if it's like just a unique and quirky comp, like being able to look at the individual pieces, like really helps to sort of figure things like how things are meant to be played. Um, you know, like there's a video on Brian's channel about uh, a tournament run that I did with. In Synapse and Next, and it was all four of us playing Spruce Sevens uh, in Rainmaker, and you know, like being able to break that down is 
was instrumental in getting us out of top cut. Like we made it to the top cut of that like top level Japanese tournament because of that. Um, in like partially, like we made it to top cut in that tournament partially because of that, right? Um, it's also very much like me. It has made my brain really snowbally though. Like it has also it also means that my brain like really snowballs a lot. Like if I get like if if my brain's able to fully latch onto something, I don't really let go of it for ages, and I can just keep kind of rolling with it, and it like it'll you know it's a, it's maybe my motivation really like stop start sometimes, but like when it starts when it's in the start mode, like you know you 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 can bet your ass that like you know things will be good. Uh, I think the other biggest effect that Autonomous had on my like competitive experience has definitely been the anxiety that I've had while competing. Um, I struggle a lot with uh, my anxiety in general, and it gets really like it used to get incredibly bad when I played uh, tournaments uh, online. So I used to get really awful anxiety when I played online tournaments. I thankfully don't get that too much anymore, just because I've played so many at this point but i used to get like really really anxious when i played in those and there have been a lot of times throughout competitive where i have struggled to play at my best just because i've been too anxious to really focus on what's going on um i think the worst that it's ever gotten was when i got Vashta plus one uh early this year um I got, like, being vouched in is, like, one tier about being suggested, right? So, basically, it was, like, you're now in the server. For, you, you basically just got to be in the server for about, like, an entire cycle for free, basically. And I got that opportunity thanks to uh, Chara vouching me in. And I was, like, that made me really anxious because I was, like, you know, I don't want to let Chara down. I need to stay in for my team so I, my team, I can get my team scrims and... I, I know I'm good enough, and I, I, can, I want to prove myself, and all this and that and the other. And it really added up to the point where the second that I just, out of the blue, like, kind of... It added up to the point where I wasn't really able to focus on IRL stuff too much. Uh, and I missed a uh, the deadline for an assignment. Um, not even because I was playing the game, mind you. I just, like, completely forgot to, like, submit this assignment, right? And it all it took was that one thing happening for me to just like basically have a massive um, meltdown, um, and I had to get like I had to get external help to try and manage my anxiety in that moment. Um, so yeah, it's definitely like like over the years it's been more more and more manageable, um, but like sometimes moments like that did have her, like have occurred where. You know, it gets so bad that I do have to get help from, like, family members or from, like, organizations and stuff like that just to try and, you know, cope in the moment sort of thing. Um, safe spaces? Safe spaces are, like, also probably, like, just as important. Because it's all well and good having friends. <coughs> but if you also have the safe spaces where you can just kind of go and relax, um, it makes things a lot easier, too. Um, take like I started out on the scene by joining the Academy Discord server, and I started talking in the Brushes channel. And it's been four and a half years since then, and I still talk in the Brushes channel. My role in there has changed. Before I used to ask there often for advice, and now I'm the one giving advice to newer players. But I still talk in there all the time. I feel genuinely really comfortable in there, and there's also just a, like a community of rush players who just all go in that chat and talk it on a regular basis um so i definitely get to that really safe space obviously you know talking with friends and hanging out with them is also like a very nice safe space for me as well um i even have one irl now because um i must like thanks to uh, the power of splatoon becoming more and more popular people actually share my interests now so i was able to find uh, out that a lot of people at my university actually play Splatoon, so we meet up every week and we uh, we play it, and it's uh, really fun. Um, and just being able to like in general, just being able to talk about the game um, and nerd out about it before like 
used to be so difficult to do, and now you, know, you can actually just do that. You can just talk to us, like you can just talk to the other person about it. Like being able to actually talk about the game outside of like actually being able to just talk about the game is also just absolutely insane. I think it's a really big factor behind you know what made me more comfortable was just the fact that the special interest that I'd <coughs> the special interest that I'd had for years that I always tried to make sure that I never talked about because no one would understand me. Um you know, being able to just talk about that freely is, like, so liberating. Closing thoughts. Do I have many closing thoughts? I think that even... I think that being in the competitive team is probably one of the best things that I've ever done. Like, the, the skills that I have developed, the friendships that I have made in my time in competitive have made my life so much better, and I'm enjoying it so much more as a result um and the more that i put into the community the more that i give to the community i think the more the community gives back to me so you know it's been a really nice like it's been really nice to um be a part of it um and if you want to see the kinds of thing the kind of things that i put into the community you should check out my socials this is like you should check out my YouTube. My handle is uh, Small Cloud uh, two 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 eight, which is actually the same uh, number on uh, on my splash tag in Splatoon. So if you ever run into me in Splatoon, you'll know it's me. If you see two 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 eight on the splash tag, um, a pretty like this recognizable title too. Um, I'm. You can also find me on Twitch. I stream on there fairly often. Funnily enough, that doesn't actually give me that much anxiety. So you know. Check me out on Twitch, uh, twitch.tv slash sport underscore. And if you want to see the uh, the kind of things that I put out on Twitter, uh, twitter.com slash cloudsport. Um, I, I really hope that Twitter doesn't die. I love that platform to bits. So, uh, yeah. Uh, that's... Woo! <laughs> Hi, my name is Char. I've been in the competitive scene since 2015, and I've been on a few teams such as Evolution way back when. And more notably, some of you guys might know me from Neptune, Prophecy, and currently I'm on Last Resort. Uh, I've become an NA champion in Turf War. I've come second place one game away in the ranked modes. I've won a few major tournaments, and I've been at the top level for a long time. Uh, so my parents found out I had autism at a young age, around two or so. I had a few problems where I wouldn't really speak, and there were a few things where I kind of had problems as a kid. And we didn't really know why, and it wasn't until we kind of figured that out and a few other things I had that things started to progress. So fairly young, and I've kind of, like, always known that it's a thing. It's never really been, like, hidden for me or anything. Uh, my social skills were pretty terrible. I didn't really understand many cues, and in general, that's kind of what the main thing is for autism with me. It's, like, uh, a basic understanding of being able to read things socially or understand how things are supposed to be said are kind of different. Like, I could do it now, but the best way I can describe it is I have to really think about it. Like, it takes a lot of uh, mental energy uh, instead of it being like, yeah, okay, I, I, it's obvious, duh. Like, it's not obvious for me, so I guess it's the best way I can explain it, but I, I didn't really have too much. I had done a few things, like uh, I've had some therapy stuff, I've had speech classes, a few different camps, and a bunch of stuff growing up that I did, but... Uh, Still, none of them really helped much. Being online is kind of what happened, which, uh, yeah. I got Splatoon randomly as a gift, but I tried out competitive Splatoon because I hit S plus 99 and a channel I watched called Switch Next Door had a video on it. I'm like, oh, okay, this is what you do after you get the top rank because I liked the game. I wanted to do more, and I thought, like, oh, okay, well, I'm top rank, so I'm probably pretty good. Uh, didn't know. <laughs> Was not, but, yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's how I got into it. First experiences were kind of... I don't really remember too much. It was so long ago, but I don't know. I just kind of was really eager to compete. I played a lot. I wanted to get a team and I wanted to get good fast. I didn't really realize how long of a journey it was going to be. I kind of just expected it to be fast. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm still on it. So I learned that quickly. How much has autism affected my time in the competitive scene? I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't have started out being a social idiot. That would have been cool. Would have been a lot easier to find a team. Would have been a lot easier to word my thoughts on things. Would have been a lot easier to socialize and get more connections. 
uh, a lot of stuff. And, I mean, it, it's just kind of hard to imagine how it would have been otherwise, because I don't really know it any different. What helped you to start to feel more comfortable in the competitive scene? I had some people who became close friends of mine. It took a few years for some, but I had people like Satsuki, uh, who was formerly known as Pika3K, Gamer or Gamer Rooney, and uh, Ice, who are all super close friends of mine that I've known for a very long time. And Mecha, of course, is my uh, closest friend in the scene. I've known this guy since basically when I've joined. So having people really close to me would help me out when stuff went wrong was unbelievably useful like even if it was just a few people having people that close uh really really helps for social stuff like this and eventually just with that time experience and friendship i ended up learning and uh figuring out how to act and how to get around this stuff and well that kind of changed everything for me autism is complicated and it's different for everyone for me it's affected me mostly socially and it made me take a while to really get comfortable where I am. To this day, it still expends a lot of energy, but I also don't know if I would be the same person if I didn't have it. And so, you know, I don't know if it would change it. It's been a pain in the ass for most of my life, obviously, and dealing with it has been a constant challenge that, to some extent, I'm still working on, but it's also just part of what makes uh, me myself. And, yeah, I don't know if I'd really want to change that. I make YouTube content, so if you see this video and you want to see more from me, uh, check out my channel. It'll be in the description. Hello. For those of you who don't know, I'm Bradley, also known as Hydra in the Competitive Scene. I'm currently a blob blobber one trick looking to play some other weapons, though I'm not really sure what at the moment. I'm a mid-level player who's very inconsistent currently, with 12 t total attorney first places to my name right now with a lot of things that are above my average and things that are under my average, though I tend to fluctuate around mid-level mostly. When it comes to when I've learned I had autism, I've just kind of known my entire life. Like, my, even in my earliest memories, I just kind of have known. I really can't explain why, I just know that it has had a big impact on how I view autism and how passionate I am towards having it because... A big part of knowing I've had it my entire life is not having to deal with the common issue of, oh, I now understand and I need to adapt to things. I just kind of know it from the start and I don't have to, like, I know the reason for things and the way I am, which is really nice. But it also means that I have to start dealing with how to learn how to work around autism at an earlier age. So I definitely do think, though, it had a lot of positive outcomes knowing much earlier than most. Before joining the scene, though, my social skills were absolutely horrendous. I didn't socialize at all, and I could I barely had any friends, like, one at a time kind of levels of friends. Yeah, I was, I didn't talk much. It's not that I couldn't, it's that I didn't have a reason to, and I didn't care enough. It was painful for me to socialize because I would have to change how I acted around people to make it not awkward. And in general, I just didn't get along with people very well. I am a very weird person, even in a group of weird people. I don't just get along with people. It's something I was especially knowledgeable of in the past and... While I've changed to not be as awkward to be around, I, I'm i still awkward to be around, and I fully accepted it at this point. <laughs> uh, so the thing that got me to try out Splatoon was a serious chunk of coin I made on the series that looked very exciting to me after my one experience of playing some Call of Duty game where I literally decided I'm going to use the knife. You know, not the gun, I want the knife. And I did well with the knife, and I thought it was funny. So I tried Splatoon because I had issues with the regular shooters because they just didn't seem fun to me, and Splatoon seemed to fix that issue. And it did. It was a fun game for me. And then I learned Comp existed because Dude made videos on it. And I'm like, you know what? I can do that. Me, the person with a social disorder who 
has some of the worst social skills imaginable. I can do that. I thought it was funny. I, I, I didn't see it as something real. And then it became something real. And I'm still confused how it happened. It just happened, and I'm here now. So some of my first experiences with the scene, other than a team that basically disbanded after, like, two days, was Team Carrot. Um, Para was the captain. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that is the... That is the captain of the team I'm currently on, outclassed. It's just... Team Carrot happened a long time ago. Like, early Splatoon 2 kind of long time ago. A lot of... Those early days were very just me being the odd one out. I didn't talk much, and I would often just be silent mid-match instead of even doing call-outs. I just felt awkward, really, because I hadn't really talked to people on or offline. And now suddenly, I just got to start talking with people. So as you can imagine, it was weird. And it took a lot of time for me to adjust to that, and... After a while, I grew a bit more comfortable, you know? It's a bit weird and awkward at first, but... As long as you're making sure, like, the people you're talking with aren't making you feel too awkward... Then it, you can eventually learn to... Learn to do so, you know? Uh, though... My autism has definitely had some pretty big impacts on my time in the comp scene. An early example is is that when it comes to we what weapons I play, I notice that I only can perform well with things I enjoy using. I can play top tier as well, but I can do so for like two games, and then my brain has just decides, you're done playing good, this is boring, do something fun. It's the reason why in the past I was so hesitant to swap off weapons I liked, because... I didn't know if there was anything else I'd like at the time. And even to this day, you don't see me playing top tiers, even though I also am someone who says, yeah, if you're good with the top tier, play it. Granted, I've also found a weapon I'm very fond with, and to be frank, I genuinely think it's my best option for how I like to play, but yeah. It's a, it's a weird dilemma of, while I do think that players should play what's best for them, and a lot of times should never just write off a top tier because it's a top tier, I tend to write off a lot of weapons just because I don't have fun using them. And that's it. I don't care how good a weapon is, I'll just not play some because I'm not having fun. And I'll not play in a certain way because I'm not having fun. And that's just kind of a thing I deal with. I cannot play well if I'm not having a good time. And this stretches to people I'm playing with. Because if I don't feel comfortable with the group I'm playing with, it's going to show in how I'm playing. If something is on my mind, it's going to impact me. Like, things do not just leave my head. And there's also a thing where once I set my mind to something, it's, it's hard to get me to change my mind. This has a lot of pros and cons. A, a lot of cons. And I will admit it. And the time it takes for me to shift from one thing to another is disgustingly long. But whenever... I think the biggest thing positive-wise is that the level of motivation I have to play this game. Because one of the things that is very common with people with autism is hyperfixations. Basically, autistic person sees things they like. And then they do it a lot. Because it makes them feel comfortable to do it. It's enjoyable to them. It provides an adequate form of stimulation without being too stimulating. And it's enough. Of a ch it's a challenge for me that's fun. And that has a lot of ways I can improve. And there's visual like indications that, hey, I'm improving. It's also just fun for me to like take time to like, look back at some of my matches and be like, Haha, ha, I played bad. Okay, here's how to not play bad next time. And, I don't know. Like, anybody who knows how I am when I review myself, I will be very harsh on myself when I review. Then I'll laugh it off and go play the game for another 10 hours. 
it's weird. Like on one hand, I'm very competitive on on one side of things. On the other side, I'm just someone who enjoys playing the video game. And I will play this game a lot, competitively or casually, just because I love this game. And it's to a point where, like, a lot of my free time is just, okay, how do I do this thing better? Okay, how do I understand this micro-interaction that will impact this other interaction so that if this ever happens to me, what do I do? And it's just those long, long, just rabbit hole of a lot of really weird things that I go over in this game. And a lot of knowledge I just know about the game that I feel like most players don't know because they don't need to know it for what they do. And it's fine. Like, people have different levels of what they want to learn. And sometimes how much you want to learn about the game depends on how much you want to do. And even for comp players, if you want to just learn the competitive side of things, go ahead. I find most of my enjoyment learning everything about the game. So when it comes to things that made me feel more comfortable with the scene, uh, after a place uh, that was hell for me, also known as Midpoint, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not spending 10 minutes explaining why that place was the worst decision for me. I eventually started to realize that I wanted to focus on playing with people who I felt comfortable playing with, and while I would still do pickups, which was basically me playing with whoever was available at the time, I wouldn't stick with any group that I didn't feel comfortable, like, playing with. This would be their playstyle, how they were between matches, how they were in matches. I've been on teams in the past with people who were a bit more, like, their demotivation whenever anything went bad in a match was super noticeable. Like, I think one of the worst experiences I've had in the scene overall was just, I, like, I was on a team, I'm not going to say their name, because I don't want to put these people down, but they would just, loot, like, it would just be dead silence after a single game loss. You could tell everyone was super demotivated, and I'm just there, like, Okay, so am I the only one here still able to give it my all? And it was just super awkward. But yeah, it's the big reason why, it, as of, like, before Outclassed, I was so picky with joining a team because I started to realize that's something I really valued, which was finding a team that fit me perfectly. And it's the reason why I'm so happy that I found Outclassed when I did. Because, you know, just literally a bunch of my friends ended up making a team. I'm like, hey, can I join? Like, sure. And I'm there now. <laughs> so, this is the section now where a lot of people are going to be doing their closing thoughts. Not me, because if you can imagine, this is on my channel. You know what my links are. They're in the description below. But also, the links to everyone else's stuff is in the description below. Instead of that, instead of self-promoting, I'm going to talk about the process of making this video. Because it's been a lot. So, let's start off by giving some thanks to people, because there's, there's some people that need thanking for this. Uh, number one, huge thanks to Adrian, Chara, and Spore. Uh, when I originally asked, hey, I want people to give their perspective on how things were in the competitive scene for them, I got a ton of replies. Like, there was a massive number of people who were just like, oh, hey, I'd be down to do this. And then they, they, they let me know a few things so that I could make sure, number one, they had autism. Because one thing that mattered a lot to me is I wanted people, you know, if they were going to be sharing their experience about autism, they need to have autism. You know, just, I feel like that was self-explanatory, but I said it anyways. And... The other thing is, I wanted to know a bit about, like, um, how long they've been in this scene, and, like, about what level they were at. I aimed mostly to just aim for time frame in the scene, but I also didn't tell this, but I also aimed for people with different backgrounds in the scene. The skill level thing was just there. I didn't include it at all. That was a lie. I wanted to find three people who did not share the same number of time in the scene, 
and experiences with similar to mine and well i think out of the massive list of people which by the way if you're one of those people huge thanks for for like giving your time to just just offer your assistance because it was crazy having to go through that many people and choosing and i kind of wish i could have done more but this video is already getting kind of lanky and I don't want to turn this into a 10-hour video. <laughs> as great as that be, I know it's really bad for getting the point across. And I'm already rambling anyways, but yeah. I also want to give, out, give a shout-out to Chara, who scared me shitless when 10 seconds after I made the post, he replied. I just want to get that out of my system. Now it's out. Anyways, I'm going to stop ranting. And we're going to be ending off the video by just simply saying uh, thank you all for watching. And if you enjoyed or want to see more about anyone in this video, check the description below. Everyone's links are going to be there. And if they're not, they'll be edited within the next few minutes of uploading this. Because future me, do not forget to do that. On top of this, I'm also going to be linking a specific Splatoon server. Splatoon Stronghold is a really really great place for players to be able to meet each other and learn how to figure out how the comp scene is and how to get yourself integrated i want to link this because whether you have autism or not if you're looking to join the competitive scene this is probably one of the best servers you can join right now if not the best and this video isn't just about helping people with autism feel motivated to get to like give the scene a shot or to, to feel like there's hope for them. I genuinely just want to get the idea that, that if you're feeling on the fence about joining the comp scene, give it a shot. Trying it out is not much of a commitment. And if you do enjoy it, you can commit to the whole comp thing. If not, then you can just join in from time to time when you have the availability or you can just not join if you don't feel like it fits you. Either way, though, I've ranted way longer than I should have. So, uh, thank y'all for watching. See y'all next video I make. Bye.